Proud to be sponsored by Diamond Bright, the car care products that have been keeping the furious fleet looking their best for a long time already. To find all you need to keep your car clean and protected, follow the link below to diamondbright.co.uk. You join me today at the wheel of something rather interesting, a front-engine water-cooled Porsche. Mmm, what can it be? It's a 944 S2. Hello, welcome to Furious Driving, and this is a 1989 Porsche 944 S2. And that's a very loud crow. As I'm sure you know, the 944 evolved from the 924, which dated back to the, well, the early 70s, really. Um, that was in a car that was not initially very well received because, as it was fairly well known, it was a design project that was initially aimed for Volkswagen, but Volkswagen didn't want it, so Porsche adopted it, an Audi 2-litre engine, basically a van engine. Um, but it was reworked for Porsche, so it didn't really deserve the stigma it got. However, it took a little while to break that kind of, it's not a real Porsche kind of stigma. But in 1982, it evolved. It became the 944. It grew into a real Porsche. It still had the big clamshell glass tailgate, the front water-cooled engine, the short front overhang, the larger rear overhang, and obviously the whole swoopy coupe look. However, the new engine was all Porsche. It was an all-alloy 2.5-litre four-cylinder. Then 1989, it got revamped again and became the S2. July 1989 is when we first saw the 944 S2. And this is a very early one. This is an August 1989 car. So this is very much as pure as you're going to get in 944 terms. Now there were cosmetic differences around the car, which I'll talk you through in a second, but most notably it was under the bonnet. So let's look at that first. So here we have the three litre four cylinder water cooled engine. The original 1982 2.5 made 163 horsepower. It's an all alloy unit, which is very closely related to the V8 from the uh, 928. So this is kind of half the engine, half the cylinders, half the capacity. Not really anything is actually interchangeable because that would be crazy, um, but it is very closely related to that engine. But in the new S2 version, this is the three litre. I did read somewhere, but don't hold me to this, that this was the largest production four cylinder in the world at the time. And obviously there were, and I think may have been bigger four cylinders in production. If you think back to the early cars, things like the Model T, there were ridiculous numbers of litres for a four cylinder engine making about 12 horsepower. Um, this was a different kettle of fish, obviously. It's an all alloy 2,990cc engine, normally aspirated obviously, which makes 211 horsepower and 207 pound feet of torque, which is quite a lot on a little car like this. Certainly the performance put it close to a contemporary 911. Now as I mentioned, this is an August 1989 car, which puts it one month ahead of getting a catalytic converter, because in September 89 they got a CAT, which restricted performance, so this little tiny window of about two or three months is when the ultimate performance of these early cars lies. Now this engine is fitted with counter-rotating balancer shafts. It's a common thing often fitted to four-cylinder engines, which makes them basically run as smoothly as a six-cylinder. You find them in generally the more exotic end of engines, like Alpha's Twin Spark U system. It's a very old engineering solution, which goes back like, decades, absolutely decades. Um, Porsche did look at engineering their own version of this, but in the end, it was just cheaper to license uh, the system off Mitsubishi, who had been developing it as a, a saleable commodity. So they just paid about eight or nine dollars per car to fit it to these motors, which then run very smoothly indeed. Now, while we're looking at the oily bits, let's talk about the gearbox, because that is not underneath the gear stick. It's back here, it's a transaxle. The only option on this car was a five-speed manual gearbox, which is mounted rear of the driver. So underneath the boot, when we look in the boot in a second, you'll see how high the boot floor is, and that is because the gearbox is sitting underneath it. It's not great for luggage, but it is great for handling because it gives the car really good weight distribution, and obviously it's a rear-wheel drive car as well, so great for the driver. Outside the car, there weren't that many changes between the S1 and the S2 944s. Um, the biggest notable change you'll see when you see one on the road coming towards you is this front end. The original 944 had a slightly different, more pointy front end. This is virtually the 944 turbo front bumper with these big integrated lamps. Obviously, we've still got the fantastic pop-up headlights and uh, headlamp washers as well. There's one little interesting aside with these. Um, they don't come on until you go all the way to dip beam. But if you flick the switch back to side lights, the lights remain up for a while. Standard fit on the wheels were these 16 inch design 90s, which look really cool. That big flat face fitting almost flush into these huge flared arches just looks so 80s and cool. It wouldn't look out of place hanging on a wall. This is a nice bit of artwork, really. 
around the back we've got this lower splitter on the S2s. Wow, that actually looks so good. It's designed for the racetrack it appears. It probably isn't, but it just looks really cool indeed. And early cars got this big solid rubber um, spoiler. Later cars got what they call the bridge spoiler, which only connects at the two sides and then is basically a bridge across the boot, um, which is kind of more contemporary for the early 90s style. You do still get this fantastic 1980s-esque big outline solid letter writing Porsche along the bottom in a big wide strip. Oh, that is worth buying the car for alone. Early 924s used to get that all across the bottom of the doors as well on the side. Ah, oh, it's so, so, so 80s. Um, it copied on cheaper cars like Astras and things sometimes on special editions and it never quite looked as good as it does on these. Also, of course, you've got the Porsche logo embedded, molded into the back of the spoiler. Very subtle just there. And a very subtle little S2 drops on the back of the name tag. Now, let's, while we're here, talk about the slightly scary aspect of this tailgate. Uh, to get into the boot, you can either use the old fashioned key or go inside the car and with the ignition turned on, hit the button. And watch that thing rise up. I have to be honest, after my encounter with my Rover Coupe rear glass, which is fixed, exploding on its own, this big bit of window does worry me a little bit, so I'm being oh so cautious every time I open and close this thing. But once you're in here, you do have a big, wide expanse of boot space. It's only about, well, it's exactly this deep that you can put underneath the low space cover, uh, but you can raise up to obviously the height of the window if you're very careful with your packing. Got the same bright white uh, carpet as we have in the front of the car, which uh, as in this particular one, despite being like, 31 years old, is still immaculate. It's still shiny and white. There aren't terribly many amenities. There's a little light here on the side and the back seats do actually fold forward to make it a larger load space if you need to put some larger flat things. If you're going, I guess golfers may have bought a car like this. You can lift this carpet out. It's poppered along the rear edge. Here's some I removed earlier. And that gives you access to the battery, this uninflated spare tire, which is one of those crazy little ones which has to be blown up to fit onto the car. There's quite a large hidden cubby bay down here. So if you were going away for the weekend, you could put, put some weekend bags down there. But this is the exciting thing which I've brought you here to show you. Here on the back of this panel is a sticker, a little paper tag, which was fitted at the factory. And this is good for two reasons. First of all, it tells you this car has never had rust or rear impact because this panel has never been replaced. Secondly, it tells you what options the car had from standard. I can tell you, the engine code, transmission code on this car is 41. I think there's only one, there's only one gearbox. I think there's only one engine as well. So that's that one, 41. It also tells you the paint and interior color, L041. L041, which is black, and this has got the optional um, linen white leather of the seat upgrades. And now we've got the options. They are numbers 288, 424, 533, 593, 605, 650, and 983. So this is quite a well specced car to get all those extra toys on there. You do notice very quickly on how solidly the doors and the bonnet and the boot just clunk shut. It's all amazingly well built. It's a funny thing, it's not like a deep heavy thump like in a, like a Rolls Royce or something, it's a quite a sharp, not tinny sound, but it's very much a clunk. You know that door is shut, there's no question that has been left ajar. Now when you sit into this seat you are almost taken aback at how low you are sitting into the car. This is genuine sports car scraping your bum on the tarmac territory. I feel like I am underneath every other vehicle on the road. The front of the seat is only like that off the floor and even then I'm sinking into it because they are deep deep bucket seats in this fantastic cream leather which I believe is called linen. So it's linen leather which is not a contradiction. You can also sort of tell the quality of it because after 146,000 miles it still looks really nice and hardly worn at all which is a, a testament to the quality. Still a usual little walk around. Starting on the door, it's a fairly plain simple design. Big solid black kind of rubbery plastic stuff at the top moving into a white, I'm not sure if this is a leather or leatherette um, panel below it. 
and you've got your big rubbery, same kind of rubbery plastic as the top of the door, but in white now, coming into a carpeted pocket. The front pocket is so tiny, it's almost not worth being there. You can probably just about squeeze a phone into that. And then there's a slightly larger pocket behind it, underneath the armrest. Again, it's quite small and quite weirdly shaped. Um, this isn't a particularly wide car, so there's not a lot of room to, to fill with door pockets and stuff. But even so, it could perhaps be a smidge larger. The door handle is astonishingly basic for such a grand car. It's just a simple little moulded plastic thing, um, just quite a nice bit of design really, the way it's going from a, a big circle at the back where you, the, the stress of it all is, into a little kind of finger pull you can just reach inside there, all in white, so it matches the door card, matches the armrest, looks very nice. And ahead of that in this white main, main section we've got Door speakers, uh, they are oval, vertical ovals, which is an unusual uh, position or unusual placement. Normally ovals tend to be on their side if you look around, or round. They tend to be round speakers indoors, but they're not, they're oval today, I guess to give room for the uh, glass to drop into the door. Speaking of the glass, here we have two electric window switches because we're in a posh luxury car, which is nice. It's always good to have electric windows. It's the dawn of the 90s after all. We want electric windows to go with our mobile phones. Then we have a little tiny, tiny nubbin of a switch here. This is the electric mirror adjustment switch. But how do you decide which mirror to talk to? How do you know which one it's adjusting? Well, obviously that would be on the door next to it normally, but no, this is Porsche. It's here in front of the gear shift. So you've got a rocker switch for forward for the left mirror, backward for the right mirror. Obviously, goes without saying. Then we swoop into this big, lovely dashboard. Now the dials in front of you take a lot from both the 911 and from the 928. Um, instead of having the main rev counter dial being the dominant one, like on the 911, it's a equally sized speed on the left, rev counter on the right. And this thing red lines at six and a quarter thousand RPM, which is, I'm gonna say quite a lot, but this lovely kind of oval swoop away from you is very elegant it's very nicely designed it's carried on into the 968 which replaced this car and this kind of swoopy surround also has the uh, the main vents in it for the center of the car as well as your rev counter and speedo in the center to the left you've got two small sub dials you've got the temperature for the water and you've got your fuel gauge and over to the right you've got an oil pressure gauge going zero to five and you've got a voltage meter which is a really unusual thing to have this kind of late into the life of cars in general very virtually nothing has a, a voltmeter on it these days and then to the right of that we've got not one but two air vents first thing is a main major vent which can be swooped up and down left and right as per the central ones then there's a smaller sub vent below that which can't be angled but can be turned on and off so if you want a bit more sort of lower body breeze i suppose that can uh, waft you that way to the left of that there's a tiny tiny panel here which has got front and rear fog light buttons which are not buttons but rocker switches and then a sub control for the windscreen wipers your wipers go on and off on the stalk then you have variable intermittent speed on this little Rio stat style dial which just rolls up and down. Very unusual but uh, very Porsche. And finally in this corner of the car, one more thing which I will mention to you because it took me a while to find it even after the owner had told me where it is. Down to the right of your foot if you're in a right hand drive car is the boot release. It's a rocker switch, an electrical release, releases the button on the boot and the thing just rises up under the pressure of its own hydraulic struts. One of the few self-opening boots I actually don't mind. Then moving away from the dashboard, we've got our two little stalks. On the right-hand side, we've got windscreen wipers. And also on this stalk, there is the headlamp washer control. So push one way for windscreen washers and push the other way for headlamp washers. That's quite fun, isn't it? Rear screen wiper is actually on a different control, again, in front of the gear stick. The left-hand stalk is the usual indicators and, of course, flashing and main beam controls. And the main lighting control for side lights and dip headlights is this rotating knob here on the dashboard to the left of the wheel and in front of the indicator. Then we have the steering wheel. Quite small, lovely, sort of clad in black leather, and it's an interesting kind of a four spoke or a two spoke, I'm not sure how you define this. It's two complete crosses of the wheel, uh, which could be considered four spokes, could be considered two spokes, I don't know, it's entirely up to you. In the center there's a large padded area, which is our horn. Yeah, that's quite a, a Porsche high-pitched, I'm coming through kind of horn. We like that. 
way down here, which you can't see because they're right in front of me because you sit virtually flat with your legs right in front of you, are the pedals. Now, these are a little awkward for someone with my size feet who's chosen to wear boots today. Because uh, I always wear boots, you probably noticed it in other videos. This was possibly a mistake this morning. There is a floor hinged accelerator, which is easy enough to use. There is a very short travel brake, but then there is a top hanging clutch, which has got quite a long travel. And if you happen to be wearing large boots, which don't flex that easily with a big heel on them, um, it's not that easy to get your foot up and down smoothly. It, take, it took me a couple of goes to just kind of find the biting point and get away because I'm actually kind of angling my foot, but like a ballerina trying to do tiptoe when my foot's on the clutch. It's not like I'm pivoting off the floor because the travel of the pedal is too long to really do that very easily for me. If I'd chosen to wear like Pilotti shoes or some trainers or some <laughs> literally anything else, it wouldn't really be a problem. Now, underneath this big swoopy curvy dashboard vents, we've got the not very swoopy, but quite small and elegant uh, heater controls. In this little center section here, we've got all the heating and ventilation controls. It's like a separate panel, actually. Um, first of all, on the left, there's the rear screen heater. We've got fan speed. We've got temperature going from 18 to 30. I'm assuming that's uh, centigrade because that'd be a weird scale if it was Fahrenheit. And a recirculation button. Interestingly though, there are two air volume sliders. So you can control how much is going up and how much is going down on two separate left and right uh, graphic equalizer adjusters, which is quite a fun thing to play with if you're stuck in traffic, I suppose. And then off to the right of that, on a, actually into the separate panel, which has got the headlamp control in it, we've got another rocker switch with another heated window control button icon on it. And this one is for the front windscreen. So we've got a heated windscreen, front and rear. And then we've got another rheostat rotating dial thing for the brightness of the instruments. Again, moving left, we've got another little rocker switch. It's an interesting sort of design going on. Everything's very much spaced out, scattered. It's all matching switches and repeating styles. So we've got the same rocker switches over and over again, the same little uh, rotating uh, rheostat dials, but everything's just kind of scattered into this little black strip here. So it's, but it's a kind of unusual design. It's kind of a design that wouldn't happen today. Because there's another little rocker switch here, which is your hazard lights. This one is hot off red and lights up, obviously because it has a light switch. Then weirdly placed clock, which is uh, just here in front of the passenger really, so it's a little hard to see from the driver's seat. Then your 12 volt socket, lighter socket thingy. And a wee vent, which I guess maybe for climate control perhaps, to sample the air or give ventilation to any rodents you've trapped in the glove box. And then the rotating release or the glove box itself. Now these are our only cup holders in the car. There is no tea shelf. I couldn't bring my mug to demonstrate tea, tea shelfage in this car because there's just nowhere to put it on the move. But we do have, if you're planning on stopping and enjoying tea shelf activities, um, two cup holders here in this kind of flock lined glove box lid. Uh, the main dashboard here it's uh, only small area of slightly flat area in front of the passenger. So you're having a picnic or a sandwich, that's pretty much your only opportunity for putting a sandwich or a Swiss roll up there. There is however, a large topped center cubby here. Now I call it large topped because inside it's as shallow as the boot. It's only like a centimeter and a half deep. So it's good for phones, notepads, pens, that kind of stuff. But if you want to put a couple of sausages in there, hot dog sausages would fit quite well. So you could maybe have, there's a small segregated section at the front. You could fill that with ketchup and have a row of small kind of chipolata type hot dogs and have like a dunking thing going on. Or, or um, a McDonald's dippers, chicken dippers and strippers would fit in there quite well as well. If you wanted to have a, a mobile snack going on just there. Right, now the center console continues here. It's, it's quite a wide and very high center console because you're sitting so low in the car, it feels quite high up. There's space for a radio. This has been changed from a more modern head unit in there. Very, very deep um, little cubby underneath there, which I completely lost my sunglasses into um, a few minutes ago. And then we've got this little row of switches here, which we've mentioned already about having the rocker for the mirrors. We've got the rear wiper. Then we've got the sunroof control because it's got an electric sunroof up here. And we've got headlamp dipping on another little rotating dial. There's also one little blanked off switch, which could be for other things, obviously. Then the gear shift. All these cars came with a five speed manual, which is fantastic. No messing about with silly automatics, ruining the driving experience. This is a proper five speed manual gearbox with transaxle behind. So thumbs up, we're happy. Then the little ashtray, which is useful for your sweet wrappers. Then the little tiny uh, chicken dippers section we just mentioned there. And that is the front of the car. We've just got two little sun visors, both with a sliding mirror. 
which will fold out to the side if you want. And being an 80s car, we have the tiniest little interior light up there you can imagine. Let's have a very quick look in the back and then go for a ride. Now these rear seats are very much two plus two bucket seats. They're great for kids, not so great for adults. I'll apologize now if my microphone is crackling. I think so um, wireless go thing is starting to show its age, but we'll try and get in and see if I can sit in them. The microphone socket doesn't like being jiggled anymore. Right, I can just about get both feet in. Oh, if I put my feet sideways, I can't put the seat, well I can just about put the seat all the way back. It's not terribly comfortable. There are fortunately latches to release the seat on both sides, so the rear seat passengers can get out easily um, if they are trapped in the pack. And these are ideal size for a kid. The only problem is unfortunately legislation has changed now, so children who are small enough to fit in these seats now have to go into a child seat which renders them pretty much useless. It is a shame because until that legislation changed, these were brilliant for sort of under fives to sit in, just completely bucketed in in these amazing seats, nice and safe. Not anymore. I think I've had enough in the back here, thanks. Headroom is very limited, I'm gonna get out. So once you're in the car, you can start to adjust your driving position to yourself. There's a manual bar underneath to move it backwards and forwards. And then there are two electric up down switches for changing the pitch and the angle of the seat to get your perfect driving position. It's a really cosseting thing that absolutely wraps around you. You sink so far into the chair. It's incredible. And then uh, it's a one piece back with this kind of solidly sculpted headrest area built into the seat. So you really are wrapped into it tightly. Also worth noting, right hand handbrake. So that takes a little getting used to if you're not used to one of those or haven't driven one of those in a while. So your hill starts are the wrong hand. You pull away and there's plenty of go, even just a gentle little pull away and the car's just itching to go. Now if you start wellying one of these cars, which it does absolutely entice you to do, 0 to 60 is about six and a half seconds and top speed's 150 miles an hour. Um, so without any autobahns around here, that will prove a tad tricky to demonstrate, but we'll do the best we can on the country roads we have. By accelerating rapidly to the posted limit. I mentioned the counter-rotating balancer shafts going on in the engine. They do sound, or they do make the engine sound really smooth. As you lift the clutch, you can feel no vibration coming up from the transmission. Dab the throttle and it just revs, winds itself up almost like an electric motor. It's just so easy and smooth and lovely. That gear shift is a thing of fantasticness. Normally with a remote gear shift where it's not directly above the gearbox, it can be a bit vague and a bit weird. This is not. This is sharp, tight, nice little bit of resistance in there. It's great. It's just so detailed in the way it just falls into place. steering on this thing is a little bit heavy. It's power assisted obviously, but it's not overly assisted so you can kind of feel what's going on with the car. It, it communicates through, through that kind of weighty feedback. It's a rack and pinion system so it's nice and accurate and there's not too many turns lock to lock which is good. And you can just chuck it into a corner and really feel what's going on. That little tiny steering wheel is just brilliant in your hands. You can kind of feel exactly what's going on. You can really kind of feel like you're in control with it. Now the ride is quite interesting. It's not kind of sports car rock hard like you might imagine. You might be expecting a sports car, this is genuinely a proper sports car, to feel really kind of crashy and bashy and just sprung like it's on wood blocks instead of shock absorbers, but no. It's got a very kind of pliant, soft feel to it, but at the same time it still does, it's kind of 
grip well, but does roll a tiny bit. It's on winter tyres, so it may be making it roll a little bit more than perhaps normal. And it's got McPherson struts at the front with um, coil and damper standard springing. It's also got lower wishbones and anti-roll bars front and rear. And the rear has got semi-trailing arms and a transverse torsion bar. Now, 944 sat in an interesting place in uh, the model hierarchy because it was designed to update and replace the 924 and sit below the 928. But of course, the 924 kept on being built for a long time, overlapping it. They deleted it in America for a while and brought it back again. In European markets, they kept on selling it just alongside it. So the 924 became the base model, the 944 was like the mid range car. And of course, the 928 should have been replacing the 911. But again, they didn't cancel the 911, they just kept on building the two cars side by side. So you had this range of four different vehicles, half of which were meant to have been replaced, but they kept on selling. They're kind of like Volvo in the 200 series, they just didn't stop making it ever. The S2 wasn't in production for very long. It's only 1989 to 1992, so barely three years. So there aren't that many 944 S2s about, despite the kind of long overall 944 production run. They had originally planned to replace it with a 944 S3, but eventually they decided to rebrand that as the 968 instead. And this is where buying cars today becomes interesting. Because the 968 commands ridiculous amounts of money. It's, it's just absolutely skyrocketed in value. Whereas the 944 S2 can still be had for well under 10 grand. This one is actually gonna be for sale for around 10,000 pounds very shortly. I'll put a link in the description. Um, it's a private owner ha has this car at the moment. And he's loved it, but he's got two of them. And so he can't keep everything. <laughs> Unless they're old Rovers and you can keep them all because they're not worth anything. This kind of is the hidden bargain of the front engine Porsche world at the moment. It won't be long before people cotton on to the fact that this is basically a 968 without the price tag. Then the prices will get silly. But once you're used to that slightly unusual clutch pedal, it's fine. It just does take a little bit of getting used to just to kind of train your foot to work at that angle. It's like anything with any car, there's always going to be little idiosyncrasies in the way you, you fit around it. But get this thing out on the road and you really can feel how the weight of it is perfectly balanced. And on the whole, visibility is pretty good out of here because you've got the big window that rakes packed past your face, but a huge glass tailgate so you can sort of see so much out of the back of the car. You are sitting, as I said, very, very low, so that your shoulders are kind of on a level with this uh, door frame. So you do feel like you're very, very much inside the car. And some cars get criticized for seeing, feeling like you're sitting on them, not in them. This does not fall foul of that one little bit. The coupe didn't exist in isolation because there was more to the range than that. As the years went by, um, they added a convertible, which is quite well sought after. And of course, there was the turbo version, the absolute rip-snorting mental version of these things. There was even a race series for the turbos. In fact, there were several race series for 944 in general. Um, in Europe and America, the SCCA series, 944 Cup, 944 Turbo Cup. These were proper driver's cars. They were rapid and they were fun. So they just got used in every way you can think of to just go fast in fun ways. Now, as well as starting pretty rapidly, these things also stopped pretty rapidly as well. They all got disc brakes all round, vented, and ABS was an option. The other option which these cars could be uh, supplied with was a limited slip diff. I'll check on those numbers later and I'll know if this car's got one or not. I've not really pushed it through a corner hard enough to find out. Now, I don't often take these cars on a motorway during a, a test drive, but yeah, on 70 miles an hour, this thing is very smooth and quiet. 70 miles an hour, we're doing just under 3,000 RPM. So we're just cruising very comfortably, fairly quietly. This is a very usable, not or virtually everyday 
classic sports car, a retro sports car. Now the great thing with this is you do get kind of the legendary Porsche build quality. These things don't really go wrong very much, well not too much. It's a 30 year old car so things will fall off and break these days. They were galvanized in the factory but uh, don't ask me about galvanized cars rusting. They can rust, they can go badly in the sills like where the plastic over um, wing guard meet. They can rust around those areas as well. Um, this one however is absolutely free of it. The, uh, the chap who owns this car actually has got another one which he put a fortune into replacing all the usual rust spots. Um, I think he actually kind of re regrets doing that now because if he hadn't he would uh, have kept this car instead but now he's kind of heavily invested in this particular car, sorry the other particular car. I think he kind of regrets doing that now on that particular car because if he hadn't he would be keeping this one not that one. And looking around this car for things that might be wrong with it, the only thing I really noticed is the uh, windscreen just starting to delaminate slightly, which is again a very, very common thing because the lower corner is kind of exposed down in the scuttle. And so the, uh, the screens do start to go a little bit cloudy in the corner. Very, very common thing on these. I think everything does feel just so high quality. The switches and buttons all just have a lovely solid click to them. It's almost as good as a Honda. <laughs> I'm joking, obviously. Well, thanks for joining me today in this uh, very, very nice indeed, very early 944S2. I hope you've enjoyed this. If you have, please smash the like button, smash the subscribe button, all that usual stuff. Uh, want to support the channel, go and grab a sticker from one of the links below. Join me again in another video very soon, driving something completely different. See you soon. Goodbye.